hush fell on the room. Like, there's no countdown or anything, but yet you're like, it's, it's getting closer. It's going to happen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Take it away, Frank. All right. I'll just, I'll just take it away. No, he's good. He's got you now. We'll just survive it. That's all good. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome. Glad you're all here. It's like I'm reading something off the wall. All right, so today we have all kinds of excellent things. We have communion, we have a wonderful message, and I have a couple of announcements. We have VBS coming up. Today we have the orientation, so anybody that's involved, please stay after. We're more than happy to have everybody here and get some things and some fun games and some good snacks and pizza and all kinds of good stuff. Uh, next, set, next Sunday, we're gonna be decorating and setting up, so if you have some free time you'd like to pitch in after the potluck, we would love to see you folks. Um, and then we have VBS. It's gonna be amazing, it's gonna be awesome. We have these wonderful shop aprons and I have my wow whistle. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, thank you, all right, there we go. Now I kinda wanna hear it though. Yeah. Yeah. All right, you ready? I've been practicing all morning. <laughs> okay, next one. Oh, that's it. Well, there, look at that. Thank you so much. So, um, yeah, you've been practicing. Uh, that's cool. Um, we, you just, I was thinking like how great it is to share. We just came from uh, doing special music at Heartland, uh, Graceland uh, United Methodist Church. And uh, we do that, have done that every summer for like they, I think in talking with the person that always calls us like 12 or 13 years in a row. And uh, I don't think we've missed a summer, have we, Lisa? No, I can't. Yeah, so, so we've done that, and it's so great to share. We shared music there. Actually, we had two songs planned. Um, the organist there and, and music leader uh, is Lance Skank, who directs music at the Comus Regional High School. So I had one of the pieces and I said, hey, would you play organ with us on this piece? And he's like, sure. And I was just reminded again how awesome it is to share in music and making music and doing it. I, I, I had the privilege to be a part of uh, Acadia Wind Ensemble on Thursday and Friday where uh, professional musicians uh, from around the state came together and we uh, met for about three hours on Thursday evening and about six or seven hours on Friday and then did a concert that evening and it was just so awesome to share in making music and then I thought we did that this morning there and then we come over here, we get to do it again here with you and uh, that's just awesome. It's a great way to spend your time <laughs> sharing in music and, and enjoying that. So we're glad you're here. Thank you for being here and sharing music with us in worship and hearing God's word. Let's stand as we pray and prepare our hearts and minds for worship before our Lord. Lord, I thank you for this time and this opportunity to praise you. Lord, whether there's two of us or 200 of us or 2,000, um, it really doesn't matter as long as we're united in wanting to honor you and to proclaim you, Lord, and, and to glorify you, God. I pray that our words would do that today, that you would be pleased with what you hear and what you understand from our minds, Lord, as we praise you, because you know our hearts and minds better than even ourselves, and uh, uh, there is no fooling you or tricking you. I just pray, Lord, that as we sing through the songs, that whatever is on our hearts and minds, we give to you, God. That we, if it's a burden or, or a care that we have, that we would cast it upon you. If it's a praise, Lord, that we would, that we would offer it up to you. Uh, whatever the case may be, Lord, I pray that we would just use this time to grow closer to you, God, and uh, to do so in the fellowship and in the love and support and encouragement of fellow believers in Christ. We give you thanks for it. In Jesus' name, I will worship. I'll make sure this is on. And it is two, three, four. I will worship. With all of my heart
music and all that blessing that that is, that there may be some people that, that you know, singing isn't their fondest thing to do. <laughs> and, and I thought, that's okay. That's perfect. I've talked to some folks that are like, I don't know, the, you know, the congregational thing, you know, singing. Ah, it's fine, but I just kind of like to. That's, that's, that's great. God is going to appreciate whatever you bring. So if it's a song, great. If it's uh, your silence as you listen to other people praise him and worship through that, that's that's great as well. So, and uh, I won't even say anything about, like, maybe you're all better off not singing anyway. So I won't even say that. I would never say that. I just said it, but I would never say it. So we're going to trust in God for all things. Letting go of every single dream. Letting go of everything. of times in my life when I've not done this. And it's just a flashing, and I think, thank you, Lord, that you are faithful to me, that you do not leave me, you do not forsake me, Lord. And then I'm quickly reminded of those moments when I have trusted you, when I have turned to you, God, and when I, when I cry out to you, I have my doubts, and um, I cry out to you, God, and you are Again, you are faithful. And I just, I just pray that in, in those moments of um, doubt and in those moments of fear, that we would cast that upon you, Lord, and trust in you. I thank you that you, you, you are faithful. I thank you for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And for each one that's here today that enjoys that fully, knowing Christ Jesus as the Lord and Savior.
We give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome each other in this morning. And uh, a warm handshake or hug isn't really hard to do since everybody's already warm. terms of scheduling that's going to happen on the first Sunday of each month going forward so this is the first Sunday doing that and so you're going to hear this message and in this song I will follow you know in the words where you go I'll go where you stay I'll stay when you move I'll move I will follow you and you might think it would be easy to follow fall into the mindset of that just thinking of a physical action of following Christ um, but you know we we can display following him with our words uh, with our thoughts, with our prayer life. There are many ways to demonstrate uh, our following of Christ. It isn't just in a physical act of doing something. That's, that's part of it as well. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think too easily it might be just viewed as like, well, in order to really s serve Christ, I need to go somewhere to do that. That might be needed for somebody, but it might be like you need to go like in your living room and talk to your wife. Um, or it might be like you need to go pray to God about something. That could be the following. So I, I, when we sing this song, I, I pray that, that, that something will strike you about how that message might be interpreted in more ways than just in the physical ways that we typically think of when we go into that. Where you go out of that? Where you go
the line that Lord really struck me, whom you love, I'll love. Um, your word, the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. You loved the world, everyone in it, enough to send your son to live here, to die, to be raised again, to die for the sins of the world. Lord, thank you. And what a great reminder, Lord, that who I'm to love is everyone around me and present the message of Jesus Christ through the, my, my words, yes, but through how I show them love. Lord, thank you for that reminder. Thank you for the reminder to trust in you that you are sovereign, Lord. Even in preparation of the next psalm, in preparation of giving our tithe and offering, you are sovereign. In these words, sovereign in the mountain air, on the ocean floor, in the calm, in the storm, in the greatest joy, in the deepest cry, you are sovereign. And you are with us. And for that, we say thank you, Lord. We thank you. We give you praise for all of this, all of the blessings, even as we give our tithe and offering. We, we say thank you, Lord, that you bless us as you do. And uh, they aren't just yesterday, and they're not just for today. We know that they're in the future as well. We just trust in you for that. And for the world that would say, how can you trust in that? And I would say, how can you not? And um, you've proven yourself over and over and over again to me, Lord. I pray that I would just be a voice crying out in the wilderness. Lord, I give you thanks for it and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sovereign in the mountain air, sovereign on the ocean floor, with me in the calm, with me in the storm. Sovereign in my greatest joy, sovereign in my deepest cry, with me in the dark, with me at the dawn. In your everlasting arms, all the 
So if it's a little bit hot in here, you can pretend you're flapping like a bird. Or taking the bulletins, instead of taking studious notes, you can use it to fan yourself. So outside of that, I can't offer you any of the suggestions, but I'm so grateful that you are here. God has you here for a reason. And uh, even though we would like to say that, yes, every Sunday we're supposed to be worshiping with other believers in Jesus Christ, the reality is you've chosen to be obedient to that, and you are here. And I hope that you know that God has something He wants to deal with in your life very specifically, maybe to challenge you, maybe to comfort, maybe to encourage, maybe to convict. You never know, but God does know, and I'm glad you're here for that. We talked about communion in Sunday school today. I feel like I should have my Sunday school class just take this next part, but I won't do that. Um, we, we talk about the fact that communion is a time of remembrance of what Jesus Christ has done, and specifically what He's done for us. <coughs> Excuse me. We celebrate communion because we belong to Jesus. If there's anyone here that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, I would encourage you to just simply pass the trays by when they come to you because it wouldn't make any sense for you to celebrate that which you are not a part of. But saying that, I would invite you to become a part of the kingdom of God. Become a child of God by just turning your life over to Him, confessing your sins to Him and seeking His forgiveness and asking Jesus Christ to be in charge of your life, to be your Lord and your Savior. So as we celebrate, the, the bread will come around and uh, you'll be served. I'd like the individuals who are uh, going to be serving to come on up front here, please. The bread will come around and you'll be served, but hold on to that cracker until all of us have been served and then we'll take it together. And if you forget and just put it in your mouth, you know what? That's okay. Life will go on. All right? Then we'll be serving the cup. And again, the bread reminds us of the body of Jesus Christ, right? That the fact that he came in the flesh. God himself limited himself intentionally to come in the flesh. And, and the Bible says, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. And what that doesn't make any sense to most of us. We'd say, oh, that's terrible. But he did that because of his great love for the world. And so he shed his blood, that perfect individual, Jesus Christ. No sin, no guilt, but he said, as it were, I will be responsible for everyone's sin for all time. I will become guilty for all of their sin. And he's the only one that could have taken that and become the perfect sacrifice the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the people. But the challenge is a person has to accept that free gift. Even though He made it available to all, it's only applicable when you say yes to Jesus Christ. So as the cup comes around, we're reminded of the blood of Jesus Christ, the, the reality that it's the blood of Jesus that takes away our sin. There's nothing magical or mystical in that cup or in that cracker. Okay, the, the matzah bread, okay? There's nothing magical about it. It symbolizes what's been done for us. And then Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 says, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's the good news, isn't it? Two parts of good news. The fact that he willingly died for our sins to purchase our salvation, but the reality is he's no longer dead until he comes. He will come again. He will call the church to be with him first and foremost, and then later on he will come to establish the kingdom. So I'd like for uh, Renee, would you just lead us in prayer, please, and we'll get ready to celebrate communion together. so much before making this opportunity possible so that we can praise and worship you in this honor and reverence to the perfect love that you 
provide that you've made us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity to be a part in this worship of you. We praise you and we thank you for our Jesus.
Yeah. Father God, thank you for giving us these hearts and minds that just want to know more about you, oh God. So get us out of your way so that we can learn more and more about you. I pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For those who have been asking about my bachelorhood, um, I've jokingly made comments that uh, cereal and sandwiches and uh, cold hot dogs are just quite fine. Um, but I, I say that in humor because uh, the twins and Joy have been trying their best to take good care of me and make sure that I have decent food to eat. So don't feel badly. I haven't lost any weight that I'm aware of. Uh, just uh, miss, missing my lady. She'll be coming back Tuesday, Lord willing, if the planes continue to fly properly. So uh, keep praying for that. The family's moved in, and uh, it's incredible what can be done in a short period of time. It's incredible what can be done in a short period of time. I'm waiting for my notes to come up here. Do you ever get the feeling that the world's going to collapse if you don't have things happen properly? And if they don't come up soon, then I'm going to go to my other notes. The same thing, but just I'm going to be putting Lori on the spot then at that point. So, and that's what I think we're going to have to do. So, Lori, you're right on target there. Look at that. My notes are actually in here. Isn't that wonderful? I used to have everything paper. I sometimes wonder, should I go back to paper? Well, we'll go to the next slide here, I believe, because we're going to be talking about an article from uh, the History Channel. Believe it or not, they actually have an online uh, articles and stuff like that, uh, some different things in history. And I, and I love history. Uh, some of it's just really fascinating. Uh, how many of you have heard of Shakespeare's play, The Ides of March, I believe it is? It's, that's in Macbeth, but you know what it's from. It's from the assassination of Julius Caesar, okay? So thank you. I, I needed that clarification there. So in, in this thing, I'm just going to read from the article, little excerpts. Julius Caesar was known as the dictator for life of the Roman Empire, and he was murdered by his own senators at a meeting in a hall next to Pompey's theater. The conspiracy against Caesar encompassed as many as 60 noblemen, which noblemen, they're assassinating their own leader. That doesn't quite match there including Caesar's own protege, Marcus Brutus. Now, Cassius Longinus started the plot against the dictator, quickly getting his brother-in-law, Marcus Brutus, to join. Reportedly, Caesar was handed a warning note as he entered the Senate meeting that day, but did not read it. After he entered the hall, Caesar was surrounded by senators holding daggers. It was a very pointed meeting. Uh, Servilius Casca struck the first blow, hitting Caesar in the neck and drawing blood. The other senators all joined in, stabbing him repeatedly about the head. Marcus Brutus wounded Caesar in the groin, and Caesar is said to have remarked in Greek, et tu, Brutus, you too, my child, is what it literally translates to. What a betrayal. What a betrayal. Julius Caesar had plenty of warnings, and much could have been avoided or at least delayed. Yet, one of his closest individuals was part of the plot against him. Now, that's where the similarities between Julius Caesar and Jesus stop. Jesus knew exactly who was going to betray him, didn't he? He knew that those who pretended to love God were really haters of God. Now, he also knew that they would stop at nothing to try and destroy him. Now, you and I know, as we just celebrated, 
that death could not hold Jesus in the grave, could it? Today we're going to be looking at some situations that may seem out of control. If you're not there yet, turn to Luke chapter 21, verse 37 and following. And in here we're going to see that all of this was quite purposeful. It was all part of God's plan. Now first we'll be looking at the hearers and haters, all of those who had listened to Jesus. But sadly there were some who were actually hearing what Jesus says. That's not the sad part. The sad part is the others were listening to and became hateful as a result of it. And we'll also then be looking at betrayal and bribery. We'll see one who was among the twelve that should have known better, but to accomplish what he felt was best, he decided to betray his master. And sadly, the religious leaders knew that all it was going to take was a little coinage to seal the deal, to turn someone completely against Jesus. And then finally, we'll be looking at preparation for the Passover. And that setup for that whole thing appears to have been done in a somewhat secretive, covert manner instead of being open and celebrated. But it was all part of God's plan. So today, my desire is that we should be careful to exercise trust and obedience to our Lord. And I appreciate what Dean shared earlier. It's not just a matter of, of trust and obey or trust and follow. It's it's an internal thing because you can't get the external to work properly unless the internal is truly trusting and following the Lord. So first of all, we're going to be looking at verse 37 and going into chapter 2, verse 2, looking at the hearers and the haters. Let's just read those scriptures. Now during the day, he was teaching in the temple, but at evening he would go out and spend the night on the mount that is called Olivet. And all the people would get up early in the morning to come to him in the temple to listen to him. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover, was approaching. The chief priests and the scribes were seeking how they might put him to death, for they were afraid of the people. Now if you're looking at those verses, you ought to be seeing verse 1 and verse 2. How do they tie together? That doesn't make sense. You're getting ready for the Passover, but they were looking for ways to destroy the king of the Passover. Now Jesus has just concluded his teaching about his second coming. Remember last time we talked, we were looking at the second coming. As, he, as we finish chapter 21 today, we saw here that Jesus was continually teaching publicly in the temple, even though he knew that just a couple days away the crucifixion was coming. And he would leave to camp out at night at Mount Olivet, then he'd be up at the temple to teach the next day. Now we might wonder, why was he going to camp out in all of it? Why, why would he do that? Well, if he would have stayed in Jerusalem, that would have the potential of him being arrested or killed. We also see here in the last part of 21 that a large number of people were there early in the morning to come to him in the temple to listen to him. Now, I just want to camp there a little bit. And I, and I don't want to add to anything that is written here, but I do feel compelled to share what I believe is a principle that we could possibly take from this. Just the idea that they were there early in the morning to listen to Jesus, teach them in the temple. Now, regardless of whether these hearers were there because of fascination or because of a genuine hunger for God's Word, they made that effort. You see that? And as I began to think on this, I began to wonder how we as people who claim Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior really make the effort, whatever time it may be, to listen to Him, whether it be through the reading of the Bible, through prayer, through worshiping together, with the church family. And I'm not just asking that of you, I'm asking that of me. And it was interesting, that morning I hadn't done my Bible reading. I'd done my Bible studies, but I hadn't done my personal Bible reading. So as I'm going through this, it's like, okay, God, why are you convicting me right now? I've got a sermon to prepare, don't you know this? And it was as if he was saying, take time for me. 
Then I asked the question, well, if we don't do this, then why don't we do it? And some questions that I came out was, is it possible that many of us as believers have become complacent and comfortable in our position in Christ? And so as a result, we don't feel that it's necessary to make the time to listen to him. Or can it be that we become so involved in the things of this world that all that stuff takes precedence and priority over the intimacy of quietly listening to Jesus? I, I don't have an answer. I just leave this with you, and you can frustrate yourself like I've been frustrating me. You and God, we need to talk about that with him and in our own lives. Then we go on to chapter 22, and we're introduced to the setting of the event and the haters. Now, according to Deuteronomy, we're not there yet. Back up. We're, we're still, remember, this was caught up, chapter 22, verses 1 and 2 is all part of this. That's okay. I'm, this is tough on Lori, because I told her, don't worry, I've got this, I can just take it. And so she's just having to figure out where I'm at next. So ignore the man behind the screen here, Okay. So chapter 22, we're introduced to the setting of the event and the haters. Now, according to Deuteronomy, the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a separate event from the Passover. In fact, that was actually a full week of celebration, okay? It was one of the three feasts that all Jews were supposed to participate in. However, at this point in Jewish history, the Passover celebration, which was a one-day occurrence, was tied together with the longer period of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the Passover was supposed to be the day before the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So they're all brought together here. So when you see this, it, you just have to understand, they looked at this as one event. The kickoff is here, okay? It's the pregame show. Then you've got the game, the whole celebration, the whole week long, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, I wonder if you see the irony here as we read that the Passover is about to take place, yet the religious leaders are continually looking for ways to put Jesus to death. You see, the Passover celebrated the freedom that the Israelites experienced as God removed them from the bondage of slavery to the Egyptians and took them into a place of freedom, their own land, the promised land. But the religious leaders seem to have been enslaved to their own sinfulness of worshiping their religion. And they were trying to destroy the very one who wanted to deliver them from their bondage to sin and to be able to experience freedom in Christ with the promise of a home in heaven. Now, the fascinating thing is, here with this religious group of leaders, they had all the scholarly, theological brilliance in one place. But they were dumb as doorknobs. They were blinded and lost because they were not listening to God. Now, as you look at the last part of verse 2, we might look at that and say, why would Luke put this in because they were afraid of the people? The religious leaders were afraid of the people. Well, Jesus had a phenomenal following now. And they were starting to see just how disgusting the religious leaders were, how hypocritical they were. And they knew that if they were to arrest Jesus in public, there's going to be a major riot on their hands. Not just a riot that would cause a disturbance in Jerusalem, but one where they themselves could be physically accosted. And if that happens, you see, the religious leaders had their foot in the door of Rome. And Rome was letting them do all kinds of things as long as they behaved themselves. And if they arrest Jesus, the people aren't going to behave themselves. The Romans are going to come down and squash it. They're going to take away any rule and any leadership that the religious leaders had, thus they're no longer going to be able to have that lucrative, crooked income. They would forever be exposed to their hypocrisy, and they would no longer be able to manipulate the people through the religious propaganda to do their bidding. So, how exactly are they going to accomplish their desire, especially during this time frame, while still looking good to the people? 
And for that, we go to the next scripture, betrayal and bribery, verses 3 through 6. Follow along as I read this. And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. They were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray him to them apart from the crowd. Now in these verses we see the most infamous betrayal in history. Judas, who had been with Jesus for a period of over three years, he'd heard all the teachings But we see how open and willing he was to listen to Satan. And we see how greedy he was in pursuing a bride. As you look here in verse 4, Luke states just how intentional Judas was in all this. He says, he went away and discussed with the chief priests. The King James Version actually uses the word communed with them, which shows a real buddy-buddy relationship. He discussed with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. In other words, his intentions were painfully clear. He was going to set Jesus up to be captured. Now Luke is the only one of the four Gospels where he states that Satan entered into Judas in this situation. And there are some who want to exonerate Judas and say, well, it really wasn't his fault. It's like Flip Wilson said. Remember Flip Wilson's line all the time? The devil made me do it. And you and I know that's not how it works. Because we have a choice. You know that Jesus spoke of the religious leaders in John 8, 44 as children of the devil. Okay? Now Judas has already shown us in a lot of other situations that his mind was not in line with Jesus. Because Judas seemed to be more concerned about appearances or what was best for him or how can we as Jews be liberated from the Romans. And obviously Jesus was never going to be on that page. So Judas took responsibility for his own actions. He can't blame anybody else. Now I know the ideas may have been planted in his mind by Satan, but he made the choice of intentionality. Satan merely took what was already there and he put fuel on the fire. There's an interesting comment by Luke in the last part of verse 3 where he says, belonging to the number of the twelve. Not belonging to Jesus. Belonging to that group that was with Jesus all the time. It's as if Luke is making it quite clear that even though he is part of that group that walked with Jesus, that did not make him a true follower of Jesus. Now, there's many unanswered questions that we may have about Judas. For example, how, and this is one that I always ask myself, how in the world could he have experienced everything he experienced with Jesus, seen all these incredible miracles time after time after time, and still not believe the words of Jesus. Now Judas is the only one of the original 12 who wasn't from Galilee. He was from, that's why he's called Judas Iscariot from that area where Iscariot is located. Now according to John 6 verse 64 and 70, and this was kind of a fun little challenge to look up and see, Jesus did all this with intentionality. That's what we're talking about. It was all purposeful. There was intent behind it. But we look back in John chapter 6, verse 64 and verse 70, and we see that Jesus knew about the evil that was in the heart of Judas from the very beginning. And of course, being God, he knew Judas. And yet he still chose him. Maybe it's to show us that we're all responsible for the choice we make. We have a responsibility. Again, obedience to the Father was paramount to what might have been more sensible from a human perspective. You see, Judas thought it would be much better just to get the kingdom established right then and there, and he's going to force the hand of Jesus rather than obey the Master. John himself called Judas a thief. So his personality was pretty well known already. 
Now, friends, Judas is like many people today who want Jesus to perform according to their wants and wishes, right? And after a while, if Jesus doesn't do everything you think Jesus ought to do, there comes that dissatisfaction and a disconnect between that individual and their idea of who Jesus really is. And as a result, if they keep making that disconnect, they are much more open to listening to ideas and voices which contradict the Bible. And folks, you see that even in churches. And finally, Satan begins to whisper his lies into their ears, and they begin to act on those lies. And sadly, that happens to the person who merely professes to be a follower of Jesus, but has not genuinely surrendered their life to him. You see, that's when Satan has that access to literally take over a person or have one of his demonic henchmen take possession of a person. And you can be very religious and be under the instruction of Satan. Sadly, we see in verse 5 almost a gleeful attitude about this. The, the religious leaders were taking money that was given for the glory of God, and they were using it to try and destroy God's plan, and it doesn't seem to bother them at all. They were glad for this. And I find it even more ironic that the amount of money that was given was the amount that was used to pay for a slave, to purchase a slave. And yet Jesus was the master. The reason this is so pleasing to the religious leaders is found in verse 6. It was a good opportunity to betray him to them apart from the crowd. They could do this secretively. So that alleviates what was most concerning to the leadership. You see, if it's done behind the scenes, you can avoid a riot. You can avoid being attacked by all of the supporters of Jesus. Well, we go on to the third point, the preparation for Passover, verses 7 through 13. Then came the first day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. They said to him, where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters, and you shall say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room, prepare it there. And they left and found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Now in this section we see a strange situation in the preparation for the Passover meal. And by the way, we're no longer on Wednesday evening, but now we're on Thursday getting ready for the Passover. John MacArthur shares, he says, the design of God was that Jesus would die on Friday afternoon during the period between the two evenings. By the way, twilight literally means between the two evenings. At that time, which was between three and sunset in the afternoon, tens of thousands of lambs would be sacrificed. And Jesus would die then because he is, as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, our Passover. Or as John says, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now the disciples would have been aware this whole time that the whole reason that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, he'd been telling them on this whole long trip, his purpose was to go there to die. Now they didn't understand nor did they know the exact time. But you and I probably should be aware that since Jesus is God, he would have known that Judas had set the wheels in motion in that ultimate betrayal. And knowing that the general public would all be in their homes celebrating the Passover, as it were, this gives an opportunity for Judas to have the religious leaders come to the house and arrest Jesus out of sight. 
of the general public. Thus, the location is not given. No GPS, but Jesus picks two of his closest companions, his confidants, Peter and John. And he gives them this information. They're tasked with the responsibility of preparing the Passover in the form of a mystery where all the pieces have to be fit together because Jesus is not going to let anyone else set the timetable. He is in charge. Interestingly, none of the Gospels anywhere show that Peter and John went back to inform Jesus it's over here at this location because Jesus knew where it was going to be. Well, the challenge is now to find all the specifics. And there's like some really interesting, unique things that Jesus revealed in his clues to find out where they were going to meet, to Peter and John. First of all, what are they told to look for? A man carrying a pitcher of water. Now, that would be highly unusual because men would only carry water in a, a water sack, if you will, a, a piece of leather that you can carry. I, it's kind of like when my wife says, would you carry my purse? I don't put it over my shoulder. You know how I carry a purse? I grip it like it's a little baby pig, and I carry it because I'm a man. I want to look like a man, right? A guy is not going to be carrying a pitcher of water. He's going to be carrying a water bag, okay? The pitcher of water was carried on the head by the women. So when they see a guy carrying a pitcher of water, he's definitely going to stand out. They're going to know who it is. Then they're to follow this particular man into the house. Now, that may seem somewhat rude, doesn't it? Like, okay, we're going to follow this guy right into his house. And that's, that's what they're going to do. But then they let him know what Jesus had told them to do. Now, we say, how is that possible? Well, more than likely, Jesus had either prearranged this or was a good friend of this individual anyway because Peter and John didn't have to explain themselves. They just said, the master wants this. And he said, there you go. It's all furnished, ready to go for you. I like how when they're all together and Jesus is giving these instructions, do you know something? Peter and John don't say, oh, what? we're, we're never going to find a guy carrying a pitcher. What are you talking about? Well, can you give us an idea? Jerusalem's a big place. There's thousands upon thousands of people there because it's the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They don't ask questions. What do they do? They obey. They just trust him and they obey. What a great example for us today. You know, I, I have to sadly admit to you that I like details, and I like to understand why. I like to understand where, what's the ultimate outcome. Anybody else like that here? If you are, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, I, I like to understand all those things. But, you know, sometimes Jesus just tells us enough of what we need to know to see if we're going to obey and follow in that step. Are we going to make the adjustment appropriate or necessary? You see, we don't have to figure out all the details. We don't have to know the big picture. We just need to be obedient to what God has revealed to us and told us to do. Now, I told you earlier that none of the Gospels state that the disciples came back, Peter and John came back. Well, they're preparing a Passover meal. That takes some time. They're going to have to take the lamb down to the uh, temple to be slaughtered as part of the ritual and tradition. Then they're going to have to roast the lamb. You know, I'm not a chef, but I know that when every Easter we have lamb, uh, it's tasty. Uh, but it's also somewhat traditional and, and part of what we do at Easter time. We also have ham for those that don't like lamb. But it takes a while, and I love the smell. It probably roasts three, four, five hours. You've got a lot of time here. They're not going to come back. They also had to go get the necessary supplies, the bitter herbs and all those other things. The Passover meal had so much symbolism 
to what was about to take place. At the first Passover in Egypt, anybody who did not do exactly as God had instructed would experience death. However strange as it may have seemed, if they did exactly what God told them, you know, take a branch of hyssop, spread blood all around the mantle and the, you know, the frame of the door and all that, and you're thinking, what? I just painted. Now you're asking me to make a mess? But God said to do it. And if you did it, the angel of death passed over. Pass over. That's where it comes from. Jesus is about to become the Passover lamb. For all who think they can do things their way and who flat out refuse to look only to Jesus for salvation, they will experience death. doesn't matter how good you are. There's a lot of good people that are going to be in hell. Doesn't matter how religious you are, unless you look only to Jesus. However, for those who, even without understanding, can accept by faith what Jesus Christ did on the cross by dying for our sins in order to purchase our salvation, don't have to understand it, but if you do that, you'll experience eternal life in the presence of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Last Sunday with the baptism, you know, Zarek wasn't a theologian, was he? In fact, even in visiting with the elders, we had a wonderful visit with him. But he understood that Jesus was the way to heaven. We didn't talk about transubstantiation, consubstantiation, all those things. And you're saying, what do you, no, don't worry, that's theology talk, okay? We didn't talk about the timetable of, you know, when's the church going to be raptured, how many years is the trip, that doesn't matter. I mean, it does, but it doesn't. He understood Jesus is all you need. In conclusion, one of the things that this passage seems to remind us of is the fact that Jesus was in complete control of his life. He was in complete control of all the events surrounding it. Jesus' plan and purpose was going to happen just as the Father wanted it to happen. The other thing that stands out to me is the fact that God's love for us was so great that even though many of this stuff, many of these things seem totally out of control and wrong, on so many counts. Wouldn't you agree? But Jesus knew that God is sovereign and he had a purposeful plan in all of that. So we must be careful to exercise trust and obedience to our Lord. And that, that would include those times when we're around those who want others to believe that they're so spiritual and they're in love with God when in reality they're in love with themselves. They're in love with their religious exercises. They're in love with the recognition that they might receive. And they might speak hatefully of you, or they might speak hatefully to your face or behind your back, and they will even come up with worldly yet spiritual-sounding ideas in an attempt to discredit you or to discredit the absolute truth of God's Word. But we don't give up. We continue to proclaim the gospel message of Christ's love for us. We don't cease to live and proclaim true biblical principles. We exercise trust and obedience to God because there are many out there who are genuinely searching and who want to listen and who want to live for the glory of God. We also must be careful to exercise trust and obedience to our Lord even though betrayal happens. Betrayal by someone else cannot be an excuse for us to stop giving our message of Jesus Christ. We know that compromise of God's word in any form is not of God, even if it may look as though it's paying off for someone else. And my friends, this is something that I finally grasped back in 2005, 2004. 
Because in 2000, I took a sabbatical, not really a sabbatical, a break from full-time senior ministry because of betrayal. And yes, I continued to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in different ways and different forms, but I said, I will never again serve as a pastor in a church. And God reminded me, it's not your church. That church belongs to Jesus. I have equipped you to do this. Now get out there and do it. Right? No, he didn't, didn't really do that. But some, you know what betrayal is like, don't you? You know what it's like to be lied about. None of us have ever been treated like Jesus. So we are to be careful to exercise trust and obedience to him. And sometimes, folks, you and I just need to be in the background, simply doing what Jesus has called us to do. Because all of that could very well be preparation for something amazing which God is about to do for the world all around us. We talk here very often. We've got people serving in so many different ways. And, and we, just, we just rejoice. We praise God for that. And I've shared with people, even like Lori this morning, I said, you know, even though nobody's going to know it, well, now you know it. She's up there on the computer. Uh, but nobody knows what's going on with, you know, the sound and with, with the projector and with the, the camera and with the computer and all that stuff. It just happens, right? <laughs> yeah, right. It's that quiet, behind-the-scenes stuff. The Peter and John going quietly to set things up in the upper room because their master said, I need this done, because they couldn't have had the Passover meal if they wouldn't have been obedient, if they wouldn't have trusted Christ when he said, find a guy with a pitcher on his head, and he's going to take you to the place. You know, there's a lot we do for the glory of Christ, which nobody but Jesus knows. And that's all that counts, isn't it? You see, everything we do is for the glory of Jesus Christ. It should be. Everything we do should be for the glory of Christ. We just simply exercise trust and obedience. Let's stand as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for these examples in your word. Some of them are very painful because we just, we scratch our heads and say, how could anyone with an ounce of brains be that way? How could they reject Jesus Christ? But we also recognize that they have chosen to listen to the wrong voice, the wrong voices. Father, it's our responsibility to continue to be the voice of Christ to proclaim the gospel message, to, to do whatever your spirit puts upon our heart to do. And we would be very careful to give you all the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go with the Lord's blessing. Find an air conditioner. And those who are at VBS, hang around.